Well, guys, welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. And uh, if this is your first time here, let me take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Todd Peterson, and I'm the lead pastor here at this church. I feel like we did like a shift. Like nobody normally sits on this side, and it was just like everybody just went, all right, does somebody smell over there? Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so anyway, uh, welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. And uh, if this is your first time here, let me give you a little history of our church. Five years ago, we started this church with this mantra. We want to be a church for people who don't go to church. Now, unfortunately, people over the last five years have mistaken. They, they don't understand what that means. They think that this means that if you, that this is a church with no commitments. Like just, oh, I can come and, you know, maybe not go or whatever. The truth of the matter is we want you to make a commitment to this community. We want you to try to be here every single week. And I know that sometimes, you know, you're not going to be able to, but just make the effort to be here every week to go to a small group. Why? Because we want to disciple you. We want you to grow deeper in your relationship with Christ. And, and we want Christ to, to change your heart, change your life. In fact, you're going to have an opportunity next week to, to demonstrate the, the difference that Christ has made in your, in your heart when we go to the Florida Baptist Children's Home and we do the, uh, the St. Patrick's Day thing. It's going, to be, it's going to be really cool, I promise. We're going to have a great time. But these are opportunities that we have, and we want you guys to commit to those. However, now that we've told you what being a church for people who don't go to church actually doesn't mean, let's talk about what it does mean. The reason we say that is because we want people, we want to reach people who are far away from God. What does that mean? Well, people who don't even believe that God exists, right? So, so people who are atheists and they're just like, I don't believe that God exists, you know, and they reject the, the concept of God. Most church people think that those people are impossible to reach. But those are the people that we want, that, that we want to reach with, with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? We want to reach agnostic people, people who are like, you know what, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a God, I don't know, you know, but I don't think that you really can know. And I think that the answer to that is, here, let me introduce you to Jesus, and then let Jesus do the rest. But it's not about just people who doubt the existence of God. We, we want to reach people who maybe don't feel welcome at church. Maybe they've been told their whole life that they won't be, be welcome if they come to church. Maybe because they, they struggle with feelings of homosexuality and, and a lot of times churches in the past haven't been too friendly to people who struggle with homosexuality. And we want to be the kind of church that, 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 that we can introduce people to Jesus. It doesn't matter wh where you come from. It doesn't matter your lifestyle, right? It's, and when I say lifestyle, I've heard of some people, they, you know, they want to go to church, but it's like I... I work at uh, a company that produces alcohol, and I'm afraid that the church is going to look down on me for that. Or, uh, you know, I don't want to go to church because I'm in the adult industry so that I can, you know, uh, pay the bills for my child. And it's like, you know what? We don't care where you come from, how you dress, how you look, what, what choices you've made in this life. All we want to do is just introduce you to Jesus. We don't want to change your life. We believe that Jesus will do that on his own. We, we don't need to, you know, be judgmental or anything. Jesus does the work, right? And so, so that's what it means to be a church for people who don't go to church. And in true Pulse of Miami style, for Easter, we have issued a challenge to all the atheists, all the agnostics, all the people who don't feel welcome at church. We double dog dare you to come to church on Easter and say no to, no to Jesus. We, can you actually come for Easter? And we're actually going to invite him back. So it'll be Easter and the two weeks after. Can you actually come to church for three weeks and tell Jesus no? And that's the challenge. We, we dare you to say no to Jesus. It's the first time I've ever said that in my life, right? But I, I'm excited about it. And, and, and I'm thinking, man, this would be great. And, and here's the thing. I'm inviting people. I'm inviting people who are far away from God. But here's the only way that this thing's going to work is if you guys invite people as well. But here's the people I want you to invite. Now, obviously, maybe you know somebody who went to church like two years ago and then they stopped going to church. I mean, if you want to invite them, fine. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to pray. And at the end of this service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray and that God would reveal to you somebody who's really far away from God. Somebody who's so far away from God that whether you have said it out loud or not, you believe that it is impossible for that person to ever say yes to Jesus. 
That's, that, that's what I want. I want us all to be able to, to take this leap of faith. But here's the problem. As long as we believe that it's impossible for them to say yes to Jesus, we're never going to invite them, right? If we actually think that it's impossible, we won't stir up the courage to go ask. And so the question that I want us to ask today is how do impossible people come to Jesus? How do the people who most churches have written off, how do those people come to know Jesus? And if we don't, if, if, I, if we're not able to answer this through scripture today, most of us are not going to have the courage to invite those people who are far away from God to come to church. So how do impossible people come to Jesus? Now, in order to answer this, we're going to open up to Acts chapter 8. But before we do, I'm going to give an opportunity for anybody who loves scripture and we're going to do a little quiz, see if anybody can get it. Nobody got it in the first service, so there's no pressure on you guys. There is pressure on them, right? So I told them, I said, you guys are supposed to be like the Bible whizzes, and so if the people in the second service get it right, then you all are fired. So, so right now, uh, we're going to put them to the test. All right, so here's, here's, let me give you some context. In a Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says the very last words that he says on the face of the planet. And he tells the, the disciples and a few other people who are with the disciples this. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let me say that again. You will be my witnesses. You are going to witness for me. You're going to go around and tell people about me. In Jerusalem, that's the city, that's the main city. Judea, which is the country around that city. Samaria, which the disciples were like, really? Samaria? Samaria? They're like our enemies. And then to the ends of the earth. That was Jesus' challenge. So here's my question to you. Who is the person that first completed the words of Jesus? You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Does anybody know? Do, 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 do. Who? John. Good guess, but wrong. Anybody else? Paul. Good guess, but wrong. Peter. Who? Philip. Very nice. Which Philip? Ah. No, not Philip Todd, right? That's, by the way, my first name's Philip. That's, you know, that's only half the reason why I like this guy a lot, right? So, so something that I didn't realize before this, and I'm going to be honest with you, I, but, but I've been teaching this lesson for a long time, teaching about Philip. I never knew that this Philip that we're going to talk about in Acts chapter 8 is not the disciple. There's a disciple by the name of Philip. But this guy is not the disciple by the name of Philip. Let me tell you, <clears throat> we're introduced to the guy in Acts chapter 1. He's one of the few people that are with the disciples, and he hears the words of Jesus. He's not a disciple. He's not one of the original 12. He hears the words of Jesus. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> then later on, he's there at the day of Pentecost. He sees the disciples speak in tongues, which means in languages that they, had, that they didn't know so that they could spread the gospel. He was there when, when 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ, when thousands of people were giving their lives to Christ each day after. He watched all of that, but then what happened is this movement got so big that the disciples said, you know what, we, don't, we, can't, we can't do everything. We can't do all of this and wait on tables. So what did they do? They said, well, we need to get some people that can help us wait on tables. Now, now I love this. <laughs> they were like, we got to get some qualified people to wait on tables. Really? You need qualified people? But anyway, they found these seven guys, and they called them deacons. And this is the very first deacons um, in, in, in history, okay? Uh, there was uh, uh, a guy named Stephen, and then there was a guy named uh, Philip, and then there was five others. Okay, so when it came time to be like, hey, does anybody want to wait on tables? Philip was like, ooh, ooh, me, 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 I'll do it. Like, Philip was willing to do anything. Just give me a task, I'll do it. Very next chapter, Stephen, one of the other deacons. I find this interesting. He is the first person other than Jesus to lose his life for Jesus. He's the very first Christian martyr. And what's interesting about that, it wasn't one of the disciples. It was one of the deacons. It was one of the servants. And he 
preached this sermon and they didn't like what he had to say and they dragged him outside and they threw stones at him until he died. And it was all at the feet of this guy by the name of Saul. And Saul was, was approving this whole thing. Saul's like a dark, evil character. And then after that, he begins to go around and hunt down Christians so that he can put them to death. We're going to actually learn a little bit of Saul's story in our small group this week. But what ends up happening is when people begin to hunt you down, what do you do? Scatter, right? And that's, that's exactly what happened. The Christian church, they, they, they heard that they were being hunted and they scattered. Which, if you lived at that time, you would be like, wow, this is totally out of control. You know, I mean, God was here and everything was great and then they start hunting us and then we can't be together anymore. But the truth of the matter is, that was God's plan from the very beginning. Remember Jesus you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the... I, I don't want you to hang out here. I want you to go out. I was uh, listening to this guy up in Alabama. He's, he's really great. He's one of the most quotable people. And he said, he said this. He said, Christians are like manure. He says, when they clump together, they stink. But when you spread them out, they become fertilizer. I was like, wow, that is awesome. <laughs> that is both gross and amazing all at the same time, right? And so that's exactly what happened. People start spreading out. Now, interestingly enough, the disciples don't. The disciples stay in Jerusalem. But check this out, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They were like fertilizer, and they were just sharing the gospel with all these people. Case in point, verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there now <clears throat> when it says that philip went down to a city in samaria it's kind of interesting because if you actually look at a map here's here's judea here's um here's jerusalem and samaria is north and so why does he say go down from there this is important because actually if you take this map and you put it like this jerusalem is very high it's up on uh, up on like a mountain so so when you went to Samaria, you literally walked down to Samaria, okay? In fact, anywhere you went from, if you went north, south, east, or west from Jerusalem, you were walking down. Now, that's an important for in, in a minute. So he walks down to Samaria. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Here's Philip. He's, he's not even one of the disciples. But he heard the words of Jesus. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. Well, we've hung out in Jerusalem. We're... We've gone out to Judea, so maybe the next thing we're supposed to do is exactly what Jesus said. I'm not a very intelligent disciple, like the rest of them are really intelligent. I'm just going to do what Jesus told me to do. The next place to go is Samaria. And so he goes to Samaria. He's obedient to Christ. He goes to, Amelia, uh, to Samaria, excuse me, verse 6. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. I believe I, he was doing some, some major miracles, and we're going to see the kind of miracles that he was doing. But the reason he was doing miracles, it wasn't just doing miracles for miracle's sake. He was doing miracles so that he could get people's attention and he could introduce them to Jesus. Check out the kind of miracles he was doing, verse 7. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. I mean, like, this is, this is hardcore stuff. This is not like, oh, she's got a little runny nose. Let me pray over her. Oh, my nose is not runny anymore. It's not like that, right? This is like hardcore Jesus kind of healing stuff. Verse 8. So there was great joy in that city because they were coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. People were saying yes to Jesus. Why? Because Philip took the words of Jesus and goes, man, I think I'm going to go there. Now, here's the crazy thing. Philip wasn't like, Philip was just a deacon. He was just a regular guy. He wasn't one of the disciples. And so when, when, when they heard that this was going on, they go, oh, wait a minute. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And they heard that this Philip guy was down there preaching. 
I, I don't know if this is for real. We need to send Peter and John to just make sure that this is real. And, and, and here's why you need to know this. Because all the Christians at this point were Jewish Christians. And for them, one of the biggest questions is who is allowed to be a Christian? Who is allowed to be part of God's, cho- God's people at this time? And many of them were saying, it's impossible for Samaritans to become believers in Jesus. Like God would never accept them. They don't believe the core beliefs that we have. And so therefore, God would not accept them. And, and, and they can't possibly understand. And so they send John and they send Peter up there. Go, go see what's really going on up there. Verse 15, when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus. Now, why is that? For those of us who have been in this church, if you've said yes to Jesus in this church, the moment that you said yes to Jesus, you received the Holy Spirit. So why in the world did God allow them to say yes to Jesus, but then not receive the Holy Spirit? What, what was that all about? And I'm going to tell you right now, it was because the Jewish Christians needed a sign that it was okay for the Samaritan Christians to become believers. And so in verse 17, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? The Samaritan Christians began to speak in tongues just like the Jewish Christians did on the day of Pentecost, right? It It was a sign to them, okay, the Samaritans, God has approved the Samaritans. Wow, I mean, it blew their minds. And here's what's cool. Philip went just to be obedient, but then after Peter and, and, and John were there, man, they got excited about the Samaritans. They didn't go and just pray over them and then go back to Jerusalem. They started a tour. They were like, hey, let's go to the next town in Samaria. And they started preaching the word of God all over Samaria. But what's interesting is this God wasn't done using Philip to lead the rest of them. Verse 26, I love this. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go down to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is, again, this, now this is why this is important, right? He was north of Jerusalem. But if we take this like this, he was, he was north, but he was... He was uh, below, and so Jesus is saying, or the, the angel of the Lord is saying, I want you to go back up here so that you can go down to the road to Gaza, right? And I'm sure that Philip was like, yeah, but there's this road that goes around. I don't want to have to hike up to hike. No, 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 no. I don't want you to go to Gaza. I want you to go to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So here's what I love about him. Verse 27. So he started out. God said, go do something, and he said, I'm on my way. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now, let me kind of break that down. He met an Ethiopian eunuch. If you don't know what a eunuch is, uh, Google it when you go home. I'm not going to go through that right now. Um, but he was, he was an Ethiopian. He was an official in charge of the treasury of the queen, okay? So he was the money man for the queen of Ethiopia. Now, I know that Ethiopia is not a very wealthy country now, but back then it was, it was extremely wealthy. And so this guy was very well connected, and it was because he worked in close proximity with the queen that he was a eunuch, okay? And he had also gone to Jerusalem to worship. But here's, here's what I want you to realize. Philip didn't know any of this. This is all narration for you and me. All Philip knew is that God told him to walk down this road. It's a desert road. There's no water there. He's walking down this road, and he sees this very wealthy chariot. That's all he knows. He doesn't know any of the, the backstory. He doesn't know that he's from Ethiopia. He doesn't know he's a eunuch. He doesn't know that he came there to worship God. Verse 28, still speaking of the Ethiopian, it says, And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. 
Okay, so that's all context for us. Here's the, the next two verses are our key verses. Check this out. Verse 29. The Spirit of the Lord told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And I love this. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. It's that simple, right? Like we try to make things so difficult. But here's what, what happens. God tells him to go do something, and he does it. It's very so he Go stand next to the chariot. So he goes and stands next to the chariot. What happens with most of us? Most of us, God tells us to go do something. We're like, ah, I don't know about that. Was it really God or was it me talking to myself? Like, that, that's, that's how we do things, right? But Philip heard the words of God and he just goes. Check out what happens as a result of his obedience. And Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? He's just kind of reading out loud, and Philip's like, do you get any of that? Verse 31, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Okay, so not only did, because of his obedience, not only does he get to sit down and talk to this guy, he got to ride in a chariot. How cool is that, right? Verse 32, the eunuch just so happened to be reading this passage of Scripture. And this is from Isaiah 53. It was written 800 years before Jesus, and it was written about Jesus. This is what he just so happened to be reading when, when Philip was there. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. It's all about Jesus. It's about the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 33, in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. I mean, what are the chances that he was there just at the right moment? And then, I love this verse, 34, then the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Man, I read this and I'm like, man, I wish... Sharing my faith with people was this easy, right? Like the guys, not only is he in the right place at the right time, but the guy's already asking the right questions. But you know what, guys? Maybe, maybe the reason why it's so difficult for you and me is because we're not obedient to Christ. Maybe if we had the attitude of Philip... All right, God, wherever you want me to go. Maybe God would put us in those situations more often. Verse 35, then Philip began with the very passage of, that, that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So he's riding in this, this chariot, sharing Christ with this guy who's so far away from God. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and now to the ends of the earth. How cool is that? And God didn't even use a disciple to do that. He just used a regular guy who was willing to obey Jesus. Now, here's what, what's funny about this whole thing is, I'm sure at this point, after the whole Samaria incident, right, he's, he's sharing Christ with people, he's baptizing them, but then they have to send, like, the official disciples over to make sure that this thing is, is valid, right? And so I'm, I'm sure he's sitting there talking to the eunuch, and he's like, should I, should I baptize this guy? Should I not baptize? Like, how do we work on this, you know? And he's like, well, we're on the desert road, so we're probably not going to come by any water, so whatever. Check out what happens next. Verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they just so happened to come to some water. And then not Philip, but the eunuch told Philip, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? <laughs> like, he didn't have to say, listen, man, you really should be baptized. Like, no, he's like, please, let me be baptized. So in verse 38, he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And I read this, and I'm like, man, Philip didn't even know how to baptize him. Like, it says, they both went down in the water, like, who baptizes people and goes into the water? With, I mean, did he fall in or whatever? Like, Philip didn't even know how to do it. 
But here's the crazy thing. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Wait, what, what, what just happened here? Philip teleported to another place. Wait a minute, Todd. Do you actually believe this to be true? Yeah, I do. There's other places in Scripture that he did this. Let's see what happened to Philip. Verse 40. Philip, however, appeared in Azotus. It's a town. And he traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. God had another appointment for him. He had completed exactly what God wanted him to do with the, with, with the Ethiopian eunuch. And once the guy was baptized, he was like, I got to get you to another place. And you know why God did that? God didn't have to teleport. He, God could have used somebody else. But Philip was the one who was willing to say yes, no matter what God asked him to do. So God's like, I need you. And God did amazing miracles through Philip. And he ends up in Caesarea, and we actually find it later in Acts chapter, I think it's 21. They come back, and they come to visit Philip in Caesarea. He's got four daughters, and no longer do they call him Philip the deacon. They call him Philip the evangelist, because no matter where he goes, he's, he's just obedient to share the gospel of Jesus with everybody around him. How cool is that? So if we go back to our original question, we look at Philip's story. How do impossible people come to know Jesus? I want you to remember, they thought that it was impossible that the, the Samaritans could come to know Jesus. They thought it was impossible that an Ethiopian or anybody who was not Jewish could, could become a believer in Jesus. But when God's people are obedient, lost people get saved. Here's what I want you to see. When God's people are obedient to his calling, lost people get saved. And many of us are here going, well, I'm, I'm no pastor. Well, neither was Philip. He wasn't even a, 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 a disciple that walked with Jesus. He wasn't a part of the, the, the original 12. But he was just obedient to what God asked him to do. And God did some amazing things through him. You know what? I, I wonder what God would do through us. Because you know what? Five years ago, um, I had a choice. I, was, I could have continued to be a youth pastor. I was very comfortable being a youth pastor. I could have put out my uh, resume to other churches that they could hire me as a, as a lead pastor. I could have just given up the whole church thing and, and done something secular. Like, like I had that option, but... Jesus had it on my heart to start this church in the middle of the park. And so because, and I'm not trying to put myself up there, but all I did was just say, all right, God. Like I was the idiot who decided to do a church in the middle of the park. Like nobody else wants to do that. But I was the one who just said, all right, God. And because of that, over 200 people have said yes to Jesus in our church over the last five years. And, and here's the thing, like 200 is not like, look, there, there's people who rent out, you know, stadiums and they, and they do like this big uh, evangelism thing and, you know, a thousand people give their lives to Christ in one night and that's cool. But that's not what Jesus has called me to do. I'm just being obedient to what he's called me to do, right? I'm not going to measure myself by anybody else. I'm just measuring myself by my obedience to him. And that's all I'm asking you guys to do. I'm not asking you to save anybody. I'm just asking you to be obedient to whatever God wants you to do. And I know that you're sitting here and you're thinking, and, and I, I'm almost 100% confident that God has already begun to put somebody on your mind that's it's kind of impossible. And you're just like, you know what? What if, man, what if I invite them and they say no? Or even worse, what if I invite them and then they say yes and then they don't show up and my... my you know, my emotions are all over the place because that's what people do in Miami, right? They say that they're going to show up and they don't actually show up. Or what if they show up and they think the whole thing's stupid? But you know what? We don't know what God's doing. We're like Philip looking at a chariot, having no idea what's going on inside of a person. 
Maybe they do say no to us, but maybe God uses that to get them that much closer to Him. Maybe years down the road, they go, you know what? It all started when somebody had the guts to invite me to, to, to a church on an Easter. So here's what I want you to do. I'm just asking, just in whoever the Lord places on your heart to invite, just be obedient. You never know what He's going to do. Maybe you're here today and you're just like, you know what? I'm kind of excited about this whole God thing. And, and maybe, you're, maybe you're kind of far away from God, but you're tired of being far. It's like, you know, I don't want to wait till Easter. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a minute to, to say yes to Jesus as your Savior. But for those of us who have already said yes to Jesus, here's the only thing that I'm asking you to do. Be like Philip. Be full of possibilities. We serve a God who makes the impossible possible. The only way that we're ever going to see Him make the impossible possible is if we take that step of faith and say, all right, God, I'll do it. Because when God's people are obedient, lost people get saved. Let me have everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. If you're here today and, like I said, you don't want to wait till Easter. Maybe God is already working on your heart. And he's like, you know what? You need to say yes to Jesus today because you're going to invite somebody for Easter. How cool would that be? If you're ready to say yes to Jesus today, let, let me make sure that you understand what saying yes to Jesus even means. Yet saying yes to Jesus means understanding God is perfect. And God is holy. But you and I, we are not perfect and we are not holy. And our imperfection and our unholiness is what the Bible calls sin. And sin separates us from a holy and perfect God. In fact, our sin offends the very nature of who God is. So there is nothing that we can do to fix our, our sin. There's nothing that we can do to fix the divide between us and God. There is no amount of church attendance. There is no amount of money that we can give. There is no, no amount of good things that we can do that will fix the problem. We are hopelessly lost. But if you've missed out on everything else I've said here today, do not miss out on these next few words. But God loves you anyway. You say, but how do you know, Todd? You don't know the things that I've done in my life. And you're right, I don't. But I know what God has done. He sent his only precious child to die for you and for me. Perhaps you have people in this life who love you, but I can guarantee you this. There is nobody on the face of this planet that will allow their precious child to die for you. That is the unbelievable and unmistakable love of God. So the story goes that God sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth. That Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I are not capable of living. But at the end of his time here on earth, instead of Jesus going back up into heaven, which is what he deserved to do, he laid down his life on a cross. He allowed himself to be executed like murderers were executed, even though he was completely innocent. Why? So that no matter what you and I have done in this life, when we believe in Jesus, our sins are placed on Him and His righteousness is placed on us. The best part of this story is that when we say yes to Jesus as our Savior, He allows us to become a child of God just like He is. So if you're here today and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, in a moment I'm going to have you raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, I'm just, I, I just want to know who I'm praying with the way that we say yes to Jesus we just pray and we just say Jesus I believe in you so if you're here today today's the day I need to say yes to Jesus I need to become a child of God today I want to ask you that you raise your hand right now anybody here Either everybody here is a believer or there's somebody here that's still working on that decision. But here's what I want. I want more lost people raising their hands in this church. So 
So I want to encourage you, those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ, I want you to be inviting people to church. Invite them on Easter. If they can't come on Easter, invite them beforehand. Who cares? We're going to do this every week. At the end of the day, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be obedient to you. Whatever you ask us to do, Lord, even though it's scary to put ourselves out there to to invite people, to be vulnerable with other people, but yet, Lord, that is exactly what you've called us to do. You have called us to be your witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Lord, it is because somebody else was obedient that we are believers in Jesus. And so, Lord, help us to be obedient so others might be believers in Jesus as well. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.